If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and then uh, Numbers chapter 8, your phone, iPad, if you follow on our church app, has the notes there. We still do paper notes and whatnot. And so, uh, so yeah, so uh, Ephesians 2.10 and Numbers 8.12. We're going to go back and forth between these two scriptures uh, throughout this message today. As you just heard Nathan say, and as you probably know, we are taking the month of July to focus on our community and beyond, as you've seen with the flags as you walked up or the posters in the lobby, uh, July 31st is serve day, uh, but we're really tagging this month as serve month, right? And we've done this, we didn't do it last year in 2020, but the last couple of years before that, uh, we, we tried to dedicate the whole month to serving our community and beyond. And we started last week. Uh, we, uh, if you wasn't here, I encourage you to go listen to the message. I'm going to reference a little bit of Fabian's message. We had Fabian Gretsch here with us last week, uh, and he has the ministry Freedom to the Captives in Northern Iraq, and he preached and he showed what he was doing. The Lord is using this man and his team, his family in a mighty way. They preached the gospel, if you wasn't here, inside of a mosque, an active mosque in Iraq, an hour south of Baghdad. Isn't that amazing? And then afterwards gave away food and Bibles. And it was so cool because on the 4th of July, as we celebrated our Independence Day and freedom, he was telling me earlier in the week, and, and my wife and I got to spend time with him the night before, and, and me and some of the pastors we went out uh, with him after lunch. But he was telling me earlier in the week before he came that he said, man, the city they preached in was called the Triangle. One of them of three cities, Baghdad was one, and this city was called the Triangle of Death because they lost so many U.S. troops. And so he was saying that those troops didn't lose their lives in vain. They went in there and freed Iraq from the, from the dictator Saddam Hussein and made a way for them to preach the gospel now in those cities. Amen? So what a blessing. So again, thank you for all of our men and women and, and the armed forces and, and the military. What a blessing. And when he said that, I said, brother, you preached on four of July. You got to share that. So, hey, if you wasn't here last week, I encourage you to go. It's going to encourage you gonna, to, to watch it. But I said I had to say we technically started last week because we picked up our monthly missions offering and you, along with the first service, gave over $9,000 to go towards freedom to the cop- captives in Iraq. So thank you. Give yourself a round of applause, pat on the back. And then we, we put some more from our missions account, made it to even uh, $10,000 that we sent to them to continue. So, hey, listen, you're already serving the people of Iraq if you gave last week. Amen. And so uh, serving uh, and so the rest of the week, the rest of this month, we're going to give you many opportunities, different ways you can serve both in the community and in the church. We know that serving is a major way we make a difference in the lives of those around us that can last for an eternity. See, lost people, non-believers, atheists, anybody can serve, but if you serve along the purpose God has given you, it'll be, an, it'll be for an, an eternal purpose. It'll last for all eternity. Some people can serve and help people in this life, but when this life's over, that's all there is. What we're doing is we're trying to serve people so we can show and share the love of Jesus and the truth of the gospel. Amen? You know, this was God's plan for us from the very beginning. If you're in Ephesians 2.10, look what it says. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Come on, why don't you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the plans that you've had for us long ago. May we receive, embrace, and apply these plans of, Lord God, your purpose and our divine destiny to make a difference on this planet that will last for all eternity. Help me as I preach your word. Help us all to receive it and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Greek word translated, that word masterpiece, is we are God's masterpiece. That the Greek word right here is pioma, which is where we derive our English word poem. It's where the word, so that word masterpiece, some translators say worksmanship, is we're God's poem, is what it's saying, which is made or a manufactured product, is what we are. Think about any manufacturing in our nation, in a factory, right? Do they make anything in a factory, and when it comes off the assembly line, they say, huh, I wonder what I'm going to do with this. No, every piece is made for a purpose, right? They have a plan, they have prints, they have layouts, they have materials, and, and, and this is what it's saying, that we were manufactured, we were made, but not just a piece of steel, we're a beautiful poem. I love that, that God's created for a certain purpose. So in other words, our conversion's not the end. It's actually the beginning. We are God, a part of God's new creation, and God continues to work in us to make us what he wants us to be. See, first, his purpose is to make us more like Christ. 
When we become new creations, he wants us to be more like Christ. And Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is equipping us for our walk with him and our work each and every day on the earth. So today, I'm starting a new series called Made to Make a Difference. Again, you know and familiar with our vision, know God, live free, find your purpose, and make a difference. Again, you can actually see in Ephesians 2, if you read that chapter, is where we got this. It's not our vision, it's God's vision for your life. You see it in Exodus. David said it to his son Solomon, I shared on Father's Day, where he said, know the, your, the, the God of your ancestors intimately, and he goes on to talk about his purpose and how he can make a difference by building the temple. We see it all over Scripture. So notice what it says in Ephesians 2.10. So we can do... We, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. This means that he had a plan and a purpose before we were even created. I've said this before. I heard it years ago, and I love it. What this means simply is before there was a you, there was something for you to do. Before there was a you, there was something for you to do. Just like no material comes off that assembly line, and they wonder, huh, what am I going to do with this? No, God was not stumped when we were born. He had it laid out. There's a purpose and a plan for each and every one of your lives that God ordained before the beginning of time. You can make a difference by finding and fulfilling your purpose. So today, I want to show you the path to fulfilling your purpose. The path to fulfilling your purpose. You know, I love when I come across an Old Testament story or an Old Testament text that lays out a, a, a New Testament truth, like what we just read in Ephesians, right? That he had a plan and a purpose and for us, and we see it all through the New Testament. But in uh, Numbers chapter 8, if you're there, uh, I want to read this, and it, it, it gives us the path to fulfilling our purpose. It's four things. You should be there. And in this text, the Lord's telling Moses how to prepare the Levites for the purpose God had for their life. The Levites, a special group of priests that were going to be serving the Lord, and he gave them four things, or th three things to do to prepare them, but really four things to the path on their purpose. Look, it's right here in Numbers, act, uh, uh, Numbers 8, 11 through 14. Aaron must then present the Levites to the Lord as a special offering from the people of Israel, thus dedicating them to the Lord's service. Next, the Levites will lay their hands on the heads of the young bulls, present one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to the Lord to purify the Levites and make them right with the Lord. Then have the Levites stand in front of Aaron and his sons and raise your hands and present them as a special offering to the Lord. In this way, you will set the Levites apart from the rest of the people of Israel, and the Levites will belong to me. Now, I want to read verse 15 in a different translation. After that, after what? These three things. After that, the Levites may come, look at this, serve at the tent of meeting once you have ceremonially cleansed them and presented them as a presentation offering. So there's four things, four ways to, the, to, to get to the path of your purpose or fulfill the path to fulfilling your purpose. Let's look at number one. It all starts with this. Number one is salvation. It's salvation. Numbers 8, 12, look at what it says. Next, the Levites are to lay their hands on the heads of the bulls. Sacrifice one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to the Lord. Look what it says here. To make atonement for the Levites. Now, you may be new to Christianity, new to church. You've maybe never heard that word before, atonement. What does that word mean? Atonement is a theological term for God's provision to deal with human sin. Human beings have a problem, and it's called sin. All of us have a sin issue, a sin problem, and we can't deal with that issue alone. There's no way we can try to do it. There's no way. The path to your purpose, we focus on serving. You know what? That's You can serve, but listen, serving is not going to get you into heaven. We want you to serve. We encourage you today to pull out your phone, sign up for Serve Day. I want to encourage you to do that before you leave today. I'm going to give you another way you can leave with something in your hands today to help serve other people. But you know what? Listen, it has to start with salvation. Some people think, I can be a good person. I can do a few good things. Man, I'm going to serve on July 31st. And man, I should punch my ticket to heaven. It don't work that way. It starts with salvation. The sin problem that we have we needed atonement. In the Old Testament, it would primarily means purification, but in some contexts, it's forgiveness, pardon, or reconciliation as well. The basis of this is basically a substitute sacrifice offered in faith. Why did I say all of that? Because every single Old Testament sacrifice were types and shadows of the great and final sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. 
Every one. If you read the sacrifices in the Old Testament, every single one pointed to Jesus. Pointed to the sacrifice, the atoning blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gave himself on the cross as a sin offering to make atonement for us and to make us right with God. You remember that word atonement focuses on forgiveness, pardon, but reconciliation. You see, that's what happened. The priest had to do this, but Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins and reconcile us back to himself. First part of our vision is for you to know God. You cannot ever know God intimately without going through his son, Jesus, without accepting the finished work of the atoning blood that he shed on the cross. Now let's go back to Ephesians 2, drive this point back home from the New Testament. We read Ephesians 2.10, let's start back in verse 1. Let's go all the way up. It says this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. We spent all last month, if you remember, exposing the devil, right? Exposing the enemy. If you wasn't here last week, I want to encourage you to, 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 to check that out. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very own nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. A lot of people say, man, yeah, but God's a loving God, a forgiving God. He is. But the Bible makes it clear he also gets angry. And we can fall under his anger because of sin, right? All right, two people believe that. But that's what the Bible says. But th this is, that's the bad news. You know, the gospel means good news, and you can't have good news without bad news. In order for you to have good news... There's got to be bad news. That's the bad news. Because of sin, we all fall under God's righteous anger. But praise God for good news. Look, Neslon says, but God, who is rich in mercy, and he loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Drop down to verse 8. Let's read verses 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believe. How many of y'all thankful for grace, right? And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast, right? You don't, you don't serve to get saved. You save for, you get saved first, and then your service will be productive. Because look, he lays out sin. We were all dead in sin, disobedient, subject to God's anger and wrath. And then he says this, but look, God made a pro away. He made a provision for us to be saved and right with him. And then go back to verse 10. He has, for we are God's masterpiece, his point. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It all starts with salvation, church. It all starts with that. These verses make it clear, again, about our sin, disobedience. But God's love, grace, and mercy, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus died to make atonement for our sins, right? So listen, this makes it clear that if Jesus died on the cross and we would be saved to go straight to heaven, we would just get zapped up like that, right? No, but Paul makes it clear that we are saved. We are going to spend eternity if we trust in Christ. But he did this so we can carry out our purpose, the good things he had planned for us from the beginning, the rest of our days we hear. Amen. Are y'all tracking with me? In other words, he did all this so we could fulfill our purpose. Listen, it all starts with salvation. I had no idea what I was going to do and what my purpose was before I got saved. I wasn't running around as an elementary and middle school kid going, man, you know what? I want to be a pastor one day. That, that seems cool to like to, to get up and, and, and then maybe preach. I have a, a pastor friend of mine here in town and he said that that is the, the less his dad was a pastor. He said, man, this is the last thing I thought I was going to want to do. He said, I'd have to write a paper every week and then present it to a group of people. He said, that's the last thing I want to do, right? You know, right? But it's true. If you, I had a good friend of mine from uh, high school here at the early service. I have quite a few come here. I promise you I'd have been least less likely of another one sitting back there to be a pastor. I didn't know what my purpose was. But just yesterday, actually, yesterday to the day, July 10th, 2002, it was 19 years ago, I walked down this aisle to this very spot and I got saved. I experienced <laughs> salvation, the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it wasn't long after that that the Lord began to show me my purpose. Matter of fact, I remember the first time I had a glimpse of what God called me to do. I can tell you where I was sitting. I was sitting back here about two or three rows away from that wall in the back to the left of the tithe boxes. Pastor Ty was up here preaching. I can remember the color suit he was wearing. And I remember as he was preaching, I just had the thought, 
man, I think I, I think I could do that one day. And that was it. That's the first, and that was it. I didn't like have this. I just thought, man, I, I think I, would, I, I can, I'd want to do that one day. And that was it. Service ended, went to lunch and everything. But it was the first time that God planted the seed of what my purpose was. But I never would have got that if it wouldn't have started here with salvation, right? So we truly going to know our purpose. We got to truly be saved. We got to truly be born again. See, if you don't know your purpose in life, you're not going to know it if you're not right with God. Remember, atonement means him making us right with God. So there may be some of you in here today, you have not truly experienced salvation. You have not truly been born again. You're still living under the weight of that sin and disobedience, maybe walking in darkness. And in a few minutes here, I'm going to give you the opportunity to experience the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Number one is salvation. Number two is surrender. All of these are one word today, surrender. Look at Numbers 8.13. Then have the Levites stand in front of Aaron and his sons and raise your hands and present them as a special offering to the Lord. We all know that raising your hands straight up is a universal sign of surrender, right? When you see, whether in real life, I've heard, you know, uh, even old Western movies, right? Stick them up, put them up, right? What do people do? Like, I surrender, man, whatever you want to do. If that's why when we worship, that's why we still encourage you to raise your hands. It's an outward sign of hopefully an inward commitment that you're surrendering to the Lord. I referenced this. Fabian preached an awesome message last week called the two sides of the cross. One side is salvation, how we are forgiven and stuff. The other side is surrender. As a matter of fact, he said that, and I looked it up. He's absolutely true. There's only the word, we, we say it often, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The word Savior is actually only mentioned a handful of times in the Bible. The word Lord is mentioned thousands of times. So you know how we always say God's given us two ears and one mouth so we should listen more than talk? Well, you know, it's funny. We say our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We put it first in the saying, but we usually put it second in our life. Come on, let that settle in for a minute. Him being Lord should be first. Yes, well, I mean, when we get saved, he's our Savior like that. But he, we need to quickly move to him being our Lord. And that's something we got to walk out every day. If you want to fulfill your purpose, you got to live a surrendered life. So what is God calling you to do? What is his purpose for you he planned on ago? The key to knowing your God-given purpose is surrendering your life and your will to the Lord Jesus. The word Lord actually means supreme master. So when that word is Lord, that's why it, it means supreme master. You can't get any higher than that. I'm going to show you in the scripture later where they, they refer to Jesus as the master. See, the Lord used me and many other people on this platform before with this microphone. You know, and you would think, well, man, I'm on this platform, I'm on this microphone, so I could probably just jump on one of these other microphones when the worship team comes back up, and I could sing with them, and it would probably sound amazing. Right? Miss Roxy's like, ah, I think you, you're stretching your faith there, buddy. No, even though I'm in this arena and I'm up here every Sunday, my purpose is not on that piano. My purpose is on this mic, not on that one. I'm, now, there's people that are gifted like Blue and James. Them brothers could both sing and preach. And so you know what? But for me, I know that's not my calling. That's not part of my purpose, right? So maybe you're thinking, I don't know what my purpose is. My question to you would be, are you living a surrendered life? See, we can help you to find out what your purpose is through next steps. And I do, I encourage you, if you don't know, you've never been through next steps, you say, Brandon, I don't know my purpose, how God created me. What, you know, we jump into next steps right after service. We can help you to find your purpose, but we would never can help you fulfill your purpose if you're not surrendered. We'll help you find it. But only you can truly fulfill it, and it comes with surrender. Because God will show it to you, but if you're not willing to go that route, you're never going to fulfill it. Like, no, God, I know you're calling me to do this, but I want to do this instead. Right? I know you called me to preach, Lord, but I want to sing. And if I sung, a lot of y'all, it would be confirmed that that wouldn't be my calling, right? You, know, you would find out quickly, right? But we, some people do that. Like, Lord's calling me to do this, but I'm going here. The whole Jonah, right? You know the story of Jonah, Right? He says, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, nope, going to Tarshish, going this way. And you know what? He ended up in Nineveh, but it took him a while. He was tet duh, like a lot of us are. So if you're not from here, that means hard head. And it, it took him a while to get there. So first it's surrender. I mean, I'm sorry. First it's salvation. You truly must be born again. Secondly, it's surrender. And then thirdly, 
It's sanctification. Again, this is another word if you're new to the church or Christianity. It's a bigger word you maybe never heard before, but this scripture in verse 14 and a few others, it's a simple meaning. Big word, simple meaning. Norm, uh, Numbers 8.14 says, In this way you will set the Levites apart. There it is right there. For the rest of the people of Israel and the Levites will belong to me. The word sanctification is the act of consecrating or setting apart for a sacred purpose. So basically it means to set apart. That's what sanctification is. But it means to set apart for a purpose. It's not just setting something aside just to separate and be like, oh, I don't want this over here. I have it set aside for a purpose, just like the word holy means to be set apart. So sanctification is the process of becoming holy. A lot of you may, you can understand this because growing up, your mom might have had some holy things in the house, like those dishes you could never touch. They were set apart for decoration, Right. You know, you ever had that? I remember I had a friend growing up. I went in his bathroom. I said, hey, man, can I use the bathroom? Yeah, I said, I need to go wash my hands. He said, oh, yeah, but don't use the soap in the bathroom. I was like, why not? He's like, because my mom said we can't use that soap. It's just for show. <laughs> but it's on the sink. And I'm like, well, what do you like, Go get some dish soap, man. I don't know. He's like, so that, that soap was set apart. But the purpose was just to look at it, which anyway, that's, but that's the picture. It's being set apart from sin and wickedness to God. He's setting us apart from the world, from sin, from wickedness, from evil, and set apart to God. But remember, for a sacred purpose. Yes, so we can be more like Christ, so we can be with him like we talked about, but because we have a purpose in our life. See, some people hear the challenge to live a holy life and think it's restricting or it's legalistic. Man, you know, y'all want, y'all talking about being holy. You're talking about, well, that's, it's, it's, that's being legalistic, man. Y'all, y'all, y'all restricting people from, from their freedom in Christ and what they want to do. What they don't understand is the more sanctified you are, the more effective you'll be. The holier the, the life you live, the more effective you'll be in your calling, in your purpose, and in serving. Look, let, the Apostle Paul, going back to the New Testament, connects the sanctification process being set apart with his purpose. Second Corinthians 6, 3 and 4. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. Notice he didn't say we talk, preach, whatever. He said we live. The way we live, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. And then look what he says. And no one will find fault with our ministry, with the calling and the purpose he had. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. Then he goes on to quote an Old Testament verse in verse 17 of that same chapter. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. Now, obviously, we always talk about serving others, witnessing. Yes, you can't totally separate yourself and be in a bubble and that you never reach nobody. What he's saying is don't do the same things that the people in the world are doing. It says don't touch their filthy things. You can go and reach people without doing the same things that they're doing. And that's what he's calling us to do. So he says, listen, we must separate ourselves, sanctify. It's really the uh, sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's something supernatural. It's a process, but it's part of fulfilling our purpose and being effective. Then in 2 Timothy 2, Paul uses an illustration to drive home the importance of holiness and purity and how it's vital to fulfilling our purpose. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 20, 21. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver and some are made of wood and clay. The Expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Listen to this. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master. There's that word again. That's the word supreme master, Lord. You'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Let me ask you, do you want to be used for just like ordinary things or extraordinary things? You know, and actually... That, that phrase used for every day, it actually means trash. It means garbage. It said some things are made and they're just like, it, you got to think of what the context of this was a potter's making like a jar and a clay and it's just like it didn't come out right or, or it, it was good, but it wasn't what he really wanted. He puts it aside and uses it at a trash can. But then the potter gets back and says, man, I'm focusing. I'm really going to purify the way I do this and get everything clean and all that and get it ready to use for an honorable use. So he said, you see, I, we, we want to be pure and be ready. You know what? We don't have to get ready if we stay ready, right? You don't have to be perfect. Sanctification is not being perfect, but it's a process. It's a lifelong process that the Holy Spirit takes us through. It doesn't happen overnight. 
And listen, the process won't be complete until we get to heaven, which is called glorification, right? Salvation, what I talked about, it's what's called justification. When we get saved and forgiven, it's just as though we've never sinned. Then while we're on this earth, it's a continuous process of what's called sanctification. Then when we get to heaven in all eternity, it's called glorification. We'll be glorified just like the Lord in immoral, uh, immortality and live with the Lord forever. Amen? So you're not going to be perfect. It's not going to happen overnight, but there should be progress. Since you've become a Christian... Have you, I lost my place, since you be, <laughs> give me a minute here. I thought my iPad was ready for honorable use this morning. Have you made progress in the process? Pastor Kelly's like, that's why I don't preach on an iPad. So, have you made, <laughs> I saw the smile from back, from back there. Have you made progress in this process called sanctification? You're not going to be perfect, but you should see progress, right? If you're going to the gym, if you're eating right, I, I, and you're spending that money, and you're eating like a bird, you want to see progress, right? You want to, you hope, it should be the same in our spiritual walk. There should be pro- progress in your life. Let me ask you this. Is there less sin, sinful ways, sinful desire, talk in your mouth, your life, and your language than there was when you got saved? Again, we're talking about fulfilling our purpose. If, when, if, if my life looked the same when I walked to this aisle 19 years ago, I wouldn't be on this stage today. I'm not perfect by any means. Ask my wife and my kids, right? And those of you that are close, I know I'm not perfect, but there's a process. I'm continuously going through the process of sanctification, of, of being holy, of trying to live. I desire it, if anything, and I'm seeking the Lord now because I want to make a difference, right? See, God has to work in us before he can work through us. Well, some of you need to write that down. God has to work in us before he can work through us. No, you don't have to be perfect. No, you don't have to. Again, there's certain things you can do right out of the gate. But again, if you want to be an honorable vessel, something used to make an impact for eternity that will make a difference in this world, we got to live pure and holy lives. And listen, that's why it's so important to spend time in the word and prayer surrendered every day because those are the vehicles God uses to purify us, to sanctify us. Is when we're in his word, when we're praying, when we read, but when we're surrendered, not just reading checklists, okay, 15 minutes, you verse and verse of the day, boom, I'm out the, no, it's like, okay, Lord, the Bible's a mirror to show us what we really look like in the areas in our life. Yes, for God to speak to us, love on us, encourage us, rebuke us, but to say, hey, you know what, Brandon, you need to deal with this in your life. This keeps, this keeps coming up. And trust me, it's happened so many times. I don't go out looking for it. In my daily reading, I have a, a Bible plan that I've been following for years. And I, I'll get up and I'll start reading. It's like, ooh, yeah, I, I need to deal with that. I messed up yesterday. I did this. I got a wrong mindset. I got to maybe, I, whatever the case may be. And it helps to continue to purify us. Let me say this. The cleaner your life becomes, the clearer your purpose becomes. You may want to write that down too. The cleaner your life becomes, the clearer and more effective your purpose will become. Amen? So number one, it's salvation. Two, it's surrender. Three, is sanctification. And of course, to land the plane. Number four, the final one is serving. It's serving. Serving others is a major way that we live out our purpose. Look at Numbers 8, 15. After that, the Levites may come to serve at the the tent of meeting. Once you have ceremony ceremonially cleansed them and presented them as a presentation offering. Like the Levites and many others before us, we all should go down this path because this is what the Lord has called us to do. The Lord Jesus himself has called each and every one of us to serve. Matthew 20, 25 through 28, Jesus called all the followers together and said, you know that the rulers of the non-Jewish people love to show their power over the people. And their important leaders love to use all their authority. But it should not be that way among you. Whoever wants to become great among you must serve the rest of you like a servant. Whoever wants to become first among you must serve the rest like a slave. In the same way the Son of Man did not come to be served, he came to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. Isn't that amazing? Jesus not only calls us to this, but he, he gives us the ultimate example by laying down his life, the way he lived his life, and then by laying down his life. See, he laid down his life, it all goes back to the beginning, to save us so we can have salvation, and so we can begin to serve just like he does. We can have salvation, be surrendered, and go through this process 
You see, every one of us has been given a gift to do something great. Every single person. Listen, I don't know what anybody, I don't care what anybody has told you. If they've told you that you're not going to amount to anything, you can't do anything great, you're limited. You have greatness inside of you. God has given you gifts to be great. You know why? Because you're created in the image of the great one. He's the mighty one. He's great. So you have the ability. You have the gifts inside of you. You know, but the, and, and those gifts are not given to us only for our own personal gain and, and success. Yes, God wants you to be successful, no doubt. But listen what 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says. It will benefit you too. But listen to the purpose of spiritual gifts. God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Peter tells us right after what they're for. Our gifts are used to serve one another. Look what he goes on to say. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. In other words, don't try to serve others in your own strength. In your own energy, conjure up yourself like, oh, I'm going to do this because I know it's good. Do it in God's strength, God's energy. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen and amen, right? We all have gifts. He makes it specific. Our gifts are used to serve others and to bring him glory. And we see it all the time, man. People in the world, the famous people, not all of them, but most of them, they have it backwards. They use the God-given gifts they have to serve themselves and to glorify themselves, right? And we see it all the time. You hear it a lot too. A lot of these singers, you hear like, yeah, man, I started singing in church. That tells me somebody in church recognized the gift within them and pulled that gift out of them to try to encourage them. And some of them are still using it to glorify the Lord. But you know what? Ours should be used to serve other people and to glorify God. He gives us two examples, speaking and helping others. You may not have the gift of speaking, but I know you have gifts in you that can surely help others. And as I said earlier, we want to encourage you to serve both inside but outside the church as well. That's what Serve Day on the 31st is all about. Yes, we got serve teams that you can go and jump on. When you go to the website, go to our app, you'll see it says serve, the, the, the link, and it shows you areas you can serve in church. There's still areas that we need. We still thin in some areas coming off of the pandemic last year. We can use monthly help where you ask you to serve once a month in the church, but also the 31st is an evangelistic outreach to the community. You see, when we serve non-believers, it's a testimony to them. It wins us the right to be heard. When we serve them and we reach out to them, before we tell them about Jesus, we show up and say, hey, we want to cut your grass. Hey, we're going to fix that wall. We're going to fix this. We'll paint, pressure wash. Do whatever needs to be done, right? We're just here to serve you. But in that, we can pray for people. We can talk to people. Hopefully people end up, you know, giving their lives to Christ. Maybe come and check out the church. You know, I read a story just recently about a lady. There was a Christian lady that was visiting a nursing home frequently. And one day she went to the nursing home and there was a man sitting there, just standing, an elderly man sitting there standing, staring at his, his food. And she said, sir, is something wrong? And he barked at her. He said, is something wrong? He said, of course something's wrong. I'm Jewish and I can't eat this food. So the lady said, sir, what would you like to eat? And he said, I'd like some hot soup. And so the lady left the nursing home, got the permission of the staff, went home, cooked him some soup, and came back and served it to him. Now, how many of y'all, if that dude barked at you, like I would have went home and fixed him some food? See, I'm still under the sanctification process, so I don't think I would have did that. Right? Right, James? Brother James is with me, right? That would have been a little hard for me. See, it's a process. But this lady had a heart to serve. She went home. Not only that day, came back, cooked his food, served him. In the weeks, uh, uh, the next few weeks, continue to find out what this man liked to eat, was kick his food and come and serve it to him. She ended up leading that man to Christ. Isn't that awesome? And it all started with an act of service. Even after she, he fussed at her, barked at her, wasn't even, she just a guest, a visitor there. She served this man into a saving relationship with Jesus. Amen? Isn't that awesome? What, what a great, great way. Cause she was cooking. Hey, Pastor Rob sent me a, a an article this morning. Um, you know, right now is the NBA Finals. There's two teams left in the Finals. One's the Phoenix Suns. And the head coach of the Phoenix Suns is Monty Williams. Monty Williams is a very outspoken man of God. Matter of fact, he was the coach for the uh, New Orleans Pelicans, I don't know how many years ago. And he went through tragedy. He's married with five kids. Uh, someone that was high on methamphetamines crossed over the center line and hit his wife and three of his children head on and killed his wife. 
His children survived and killed his wife. And even back then, before I share this quote, this is the kind of man of God that he is. I was reading this article this morning that Pastor Rob sent me, and it was just talking about how his heart for forgiveness. And at the funeral, he said, listen, thank you all for praying for me and my family. Appreciate that. He said, but there's another family here that we need to pray for, and it's the person that actually killed my wife. He's like, look, I'm teaching my children about forgiveness. I forgive this family. I forgive them. Isn't that awesome? This is also, y'all may have heard you say this. He's the guy that I heard say, and we didn't lose my wife. He said, when you lose something, you don't know where it's at. We know where my wife's at. She's in heaven. We didn't lose her. We're going to see her again. So this is the guy who's been very outspoken. So now they're in the, he, he went, I think he coached a couple of different teams, but now he's at the Suns in the NBA finals, got two games away. If they win two more games, they win it all. And he, they interviewed him and the reporter said this, just as he was then, the coach remains vocal about his faith and says his views, he views his efforts towards his players as an act of service. And then Coach Monty said this, the essence of my coaching is to serve. He said at the press conference, as a believer in Christ, that's what I'm here for. Isn't that amazing? As a head coach in the NBA, two games away from being NBA champs, you know what I believe, you know what that tells us? Again, if you serve others, I believe God will bless what you're doing when you're doing it to serve others, right? I mean, yes, this is a career. Yes, I get it. But a very, very outspoken man of God went through tragedy, uh, you know, and God's using him in a mighty way. So there's all kind of things that we'll be doing on July 31st. I encourage you, even right now, to begin to pull out your phone, even now as I'm preaching, open up the app, go to the website, find out an area from cooking to serving to maintenance, construction, whatever. There's all kind of things that you can do uh, to help out on that day. And it also, uh, we're going to give you a chance. Uh, Pastor Rob, you want to toss me that? We'll give you a chance to serve today. So Julie and Allen Haslin, can y'all raise your hands for me? The Haslings over here. So uh, Julie and Allen back brought me this, I think, in January, right? Was it beginning of the year? So they make what's called, as you can see, it's called a blessing bag. And they make these specifically for the homeless. So they actually partner up with Bomba Socks, and they actually donated some socks. So there's a rag in here. There's um, uh, a toothpaste, toothbrush. Uh, There's actually even a mask. And I I feel like, more importantly, there's a a devotional that Julie has. And they actually have a ministry where Julie writes uh, devotionals on a monthly basis, and she put this in the bag, and upon herself, she put the church's name and address on it as well, right? So listen, on your way out today, now there's not many left, so I just asked that you just take one apiece. I asked the first day service just to take a few. So, but on your way out in the lobby, you can grab one of these blessing bags, and if you see a homeless person or a person on the side, now I know the road asking for stuff, you can give them this if it's in your vehicle. Now, I know they're they're cautioning people of panhandlers and all that, but actually they gave me one back then. I put it in my truck, and sure enough, I put up at a light one day. Somebody was asking for money or something. I was able to pull this out and say, hey, man, I'm not going to give you money, but this is what this is. God bless you. And he gladly took it and thanked me for it. Amen? So, hey, we can serve our community today. I love kicking off the service. I can give you something and put something in your hands. There's very few. If we need more, maybe I can get with the Haslings and get them to make some more. Amen? So this is one way right here. Oh, that was a bad throw. I almost hit my wife there. So come on, Pastor Rob, you got to help me out. So it kind of curved on me there. You see? See, my calling was not to be a pitcher either, right? See? Another real-time illustration right there, right? So thank you all, Haslings. Why don't we give it up for the Haslings and thank them for what they're doing. Thank you all for your ministry and partnering with with us. So on your way out, like I said, if you can just grab one on your way out, that'd be great. They said they don't mind. We'll partner with them to to get them to make some more throughout the month. So these are just uh, ways that we're going to serve the first responders. And Scott, this this, uh, Thursday, we're going to feed a steak dinner to to the police officers, fire department, all that. I know we got all the bases covered, but I was thinking if you want to show up Thursday at around 11 o'clock just to greet and love on our first responders as part of Serve Month, hey, come on out. uh, Do that because the staff, we do that. We're serving them. We're going to, on Thursday, go cook the the food. We have serve team members cooking, but as a staff, we're going to serve them, love on them. So there's just other ways to get involved besides uh, July 31st. But I do want to encourage you to pull out your phone before you leave and do that as well. Sign up, please. And by the way, when you sign up on the app or the website, you have to make sure go all the way through and hit register now. The last button, register now. <laughs> we have a few people that we found out this week that thought they registered, but they didn't hit that last button. So make sure uh, you do that. Amen. As I close, there's nothing like knowing and doing God's purpose for your life. Again, a big part of that is serving others. 
You can serve others outside of God's plan and purpose, but again, it won't have an eternal impact. Amen. It's great to serve, no doubt, but when we do it with the purpose of sharing Jesus and the gospel and the truth and his love, we can have an eternal impact. So let's recap to fulfilling the path of fulfilling your purpose. First, salvation. Are you saved? Are you born again? If not, now's the time. Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, For God says, at just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. You know, you may think, yeah, Brandon, I know I need to get right with God, but I'm going to do that another day. I'm younger. I got, you know, hey, listen, you might not have another day. The right time is right now. You know, I had a friend of mine, Ryan, that was in the first service, and I remember that when I went talk to Pastor Todd, when God was stirring me, I went talk to Pastor Todd, uh, I had like a two hour meeting with all kind of questions I had. I wasn't saved. I left there and I went straight to my buddy Ryan's house and Ryan was here and I wasn't going to his house for any good reasons. But you know what? God was stirring me. It took another year though before I walked down that July 10th, 2002. I'm so thankful that God spared me that year because I knew that I wasn't right. Again, I knew, like I said about my purpose, it, it, I knew that I, I was, if I died in, in my sin, I was going to be going to hell separated from God from all eternity because my mom loved me enough to tell me the truth for many years. So if that's you in here today. What, if you do me a favor, every head bowed, every eye closed. The path to fulfilling your purpose starts with salvation. You must be born again. Not only to fulfill your purpose, but if you're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. So if you say, Brandon, I don't know if I'm right with God. I don't know if I received that, that forgiveness, that, that, that reconciliation, but I want to make sure that I'm right today. Before I leave here, I want to make sure I'm saved. I want to experience God's salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. If that's you, just lift your hands. and I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer today. I see your hands right here in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else over here to my right? Thank you. Anybody else over here to my far right? Thank you, ma'am. Keep your hands up too. Let me see. Anybody else over here to my left, sir? I see your hand. Praise God, ma'am, right here. Keep your hands up. And anybody say, Brandon, I was once, I, I gave my life to Christ, but I've slid away. I've been backslidden. I've gone away from the Lord. I need to recommit. I need to resurrender my life to the Lord. That's you. Just lift your hands. Come on. Lift them high. All of you that got your hands up. Praise God. Look, thank you, Father. All these hands going up. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. So I want you to pray it out loud like you mean it and believe it. Just say, Lord Jesus. Come on, just pray with me. Lord Jesus, we're all going to pray together. I know you love me, and I know that you died for me. Lord, I know that I've sinned, and I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I repent, and I turn to you today, and I make you my Lord and my Savior. Lord, help me to live a life of purity, of holiness, to find my purpose, fulfill my purpose, and to make a difference that will last for eternity. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate with these today. Yes, amen. Hey, if you've made that, that decision for the first time or first time in a long time, there's a connection card in the pew in front of you. Fill that out and bring it to the info center. Now the rest of you, why don't you stand up with me? Maybe you are saved, but you know what? Maybe you hadn't focused on that other side of the cross. It's been a while since you like really lived a surrender life. Maybe you know God's calling you to do something. Listen, a young lady came up for, to testify in the first service and she said she'd been at this church for about four years and she said God has been restoring her, working on her heart. She said the Lord spoke to her and she quit her job and she broke up with her boyfriend. And it was funny because everybody kind of didn't say nothing. She said, hallelujah, like that was a good thing. And God told her to break up with her boyfriend. She was living a surrender life and she said, now God's showing me. She didn't even know what I was preaching. I was before I started preaching. God's showing me what he wants me to do. He's restored my heart, and it's because she's living a surrendered life. And she obeyed. She quit her job and quit her boyfriend. And now God's working in a mighty way. Come on, can you just lift your hands one more time with me? Close your eyes. And maybe, what is God telling you to do? Have you lived, are you living a surrendered life? Is God telling you to do something that you're just refusing to do? Are you making excuses why you can't do it or it's not the right time or don't know how? Come on, listen, it's time to surrender and obey so we can fulfill our purpose. Maybe you don't know your purpose. Hey, jump in the next steps in just the next couple of minutes when I close out here. We'll feed you lunch. 
but you need to live surrender. Lord, we surrender. Come on, can we surrender afresh today? We surrender to you afresh today, Lord. We give you our lives. We give you our hearts. We give you our plans. We give you our future today, Lord God. In Jesus' name, we say you are our Lord. You're our supreme master, Lord. And we ask that you would lead us through your will, your word for our lives. In Jesus' name. Now, are you pursuing holiness? Keep your hands, or just keep your eyes closed. Are you pursuing holiness? Is there a progress in your life? Is your life becoming cleaner, purer, more holy life? We're not going to be perfect. We never will be. But there should be progress in the process called sanctification. Come on, let's pray and ask the Lord. Lord, would you continue to help us purify us, sanctify us, make us holy before you in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives, in our actions, and in our words. In Jesus' name. Now, come on, I just encourage you. I'm going to pray over you that you sign up to serve, not only with the blessing bags today on the 31st, but every day of our lives. Father, give us a heart to serve. Come on, can we pray that? Lord, you commanded us to serve. You called us to serve. And you gave the greatest example. Lord, you, even being the king of glory, as we sang, the king of heaven, didn't come to be served, but to serve others, Lord. Thank you for giving your life as a ransom for us, Lord God, and to serve others. Help us to have that same heart of serving, Lord God, in our families, in our home, our schools, our work, recreation, here in the church, and throughout the community and beyond. Lord, I pray you would anoint and bless us as we go as a unified force to bless our community this month and the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Hey, grab a blessing bag on the way out. Hey, sign up for Serve Day on the 31st. Go to the app, iPhone today before you leave. Hit the register now, and we'll see you soon. If you need prayer, we'll be up here. God bless you.